and welcome to Life on the Rock. Tonight our guest is Jessica Cox. She is an international speaker and she was born without arms and has a list of achievements that would humbles us. Yeah. <laughs> a absolutely. pilot uh, yeah. and a Taekwondo instructor, yeah. college degree. Yeah, black and, belt. Yeah. Uh, traveled all over the country, all over the world, I should say, multiple countries. Yeah, incredible story. Yeah, so yeah. she's going to share her, most importantly, her faith with us tonight and, and her source of strength and uh, just to be an encouragement for us all. Right. Good to see you, Doug. You too, Father. What you been up to? Just dreaming. Dreaming. Yeah. Funny you mentioned that. Oh, why is that, because Father? Because I was touched <laughs> by uh, Pope Francis. He gave an address when he was in Cuba. On dreaming? On dreams. Oh, he, he went off the text, which he's known to do, off his yeah. prepared text. And he told these young people in Cuba, he said, in the daily reality of life, there has to be room for dreaming. A young person incapable of dreaming is cut off, self-enclosed. Everyone sometimes dreams of things which are never going to happen but dream them anyway. Desire them, seek new horizons, be open to great things. Dream that if you give your best, you're going to help make this world a different place. Don't forget to dream. If you get carried away and dream too much, life will cut you short. It makes no difference, dream anyway. And share your dreams, talk about the great things you wish for because the greater your ability to dream, the farther you will have gone even if life cuts you short halfway, you will still have gone a great distance. So first of all, dream. I thought that was so great because this is a theme of his. I've, we've heard him speak to young people this way and other places that young people, you know, in our moral relativistic age, we can cut out the heroicism of life, that, that life is made for greatness, that it matters what you do. There's eternal consequences. There are right and wrong, there is right and wrong. And for a person that pursues that, it's a heroic life and you can do great things. God will draw a great fruit out of your life. And young people are made for that. They have a built-in idealism. They, they give themselves generously to causes. We see it every week here on Life on the Rock, uh, people undertaking great apostolates for the faith and giving generously, putting all their energy, all their strength you know, in one sense, they have nothing to lose. Right. You know, we get older, we get our stuff, we hold on to things, and we lose that generosity. I, I'm encouraged by the generosity I see in young people. So he's saying, dream, want something, want something greater out of life. And Jesus is always the answer to that, that greater than. He, he wants to be the more in our life. He wants to give us the abundant life, the fullness of life. I heard it put, uh, you know, years ago by a, a priest in, in preaching on the, the idea of dreaming and investing in your dreams, that God is, is the biggest dreamer in the sense, you know, that, that there, you know, he dreams up a universe and he creates it. He wills it into existence. He dreams up, you know, uh, <clears throat> all these people on earth and, and all the different personalities and all the different abilities and all the different gifts uh, and then enacts it. You know, and it makes it happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can take our lead from our Heavenly Father that he is one who believes in just thinking, mm -hmm. you know, outside of, uh, you know, some sort of cookie cutter approach or some sort of kind of factory line sort of uh, attitude as to how we should live. And I like that he mentions in there, make the world a better place, which is something I tell my kids all the time. You know, let's, let's get out there and let's, uh, let's, uh, let's do what we can to honor God first and benefit others second, you know, in that mm -hmm. order, make sure everything we do honors God first, honors God first and benefits others after that. Mm -hmm. And that's what the Holy Father is saying, dream big, mm -hmm. dream so that the world can be a better place, which would mean using our gifts and talents for the glory of God. And Mother Angelica, I remember she used to tell us, you know, that we talk, our, we let ourselves, we talk ourselves out of doing great things. Mm -hmm. We talk ourselves out of taking responsibility for something for the Lord and, and we really have to give of ourselves. And so, He's saying, you know, put away those voices and, and dream. You could probably, come, you know, bring this into the uh, the three servants. You know, the first servant who was given by the master mm -hmm. the uh, the five talents. The second one given the two, and the third one given the one. The first two dreamt big enough to multiply and yeah. double what they right. were given, and the, the the master was very pleased with that. <laughs> the third one didn't have the 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 will even maybe to dream and buried it out of fear. Mm -hmm. So he was too afraid, too afraid to dream of right. what he could do maybe with those gifts and talents. Yeah. I mean, that's not how it's written up, but you could probably apply it there, couldn't right. you, Father? Right, I think yeah. so. Yeah. yeah, so the third one was gutless. He was yeah. cowardly, he buried it, right. and didn't want to dream big of what, as to what he could do with the gift that he was given. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the words were, bind this one and throw him out, 
where there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth, <laughs> you worthless, lazy lout. Yeah. Dangerous. Yeah. Don't want to hear that from the Lord. So yeah. dream big and for the glory of God and the benefit of others, and let's get it out there in the world. All right. So we're going to take a short break. We'll be back with Jessica Cox. Don't go away. Back in a moment. <laughs> Welcome back to Life on the Rock. I'm Doug Barry, along with Father Mark. You're in the Rock House. We are the Rock House Compadres, the official and the only Rock House Compadres that actually exists in the universe. <laughs> and that's true. <laughs> and we have with us Jessica Cox. Jessica, how are you? Good. Yeah, Thank great you. to have you on the show. You have an incredible story. You have an amazing um, journey that has started by being born with no arms. Yes. And you have a list of achievements, and I know we talked about this before the show. You know, what do we, what do, we do in this show? How do we, how do we address the show? And, uh, you know, the, the achievements are incredible, mm -hmm. but there's something even deeper about this that, that we want to get at, get into that a little bit later. But for the audience right now, tell everybody a little bit about your, your life from your childhood on, on, on forward, forward on. Well, I was born without arms, as you said, and my parents um, had to help me with my difference. And initially it was very devastating for my mom and dad because they mm -hmm. had no idea what kind of future was in store for me. Mm -hmm. But my dad has said and proudly states that he never once shed a tear about my birth condition, so he never saw me as a victim. And therefore I grew up not seeing myself as a victim of a disability or a handicap, but rather that I was different. Mm -hmm. And my mom said, you can do anything. And that encouragement really laid the foundation for me. Though it was tough being different, going to school, being out in public and getting stares and being picked mm -hmm. on, all those tough moments, my parents helped me and my mom reassured me, God has a great plan for you mm -hmm. and to trust in him and see how he's going to use your difference as a gift. And it truly has been. All right, let's go through a list uh, of some of the things that you have achieved in the, you know, in, on a natural level, things that you've accomplished first. And the reason I wanted to do it this way was because there are many people in the world who will claim victim. They'll claim victim status, right? That's just the way it is. I'm hurt, I'm wounded, I had a rough upbringing, my parents, there was a divorce, or there, was, there were drugs, or alcohol, whatever it may be. There's always something that kind of gets in our way. And there are people who genuinely have a difficult time, no question about it, need some help, some encouragement, and really struggle. But there are some who kind of remain in that victim state as if, woe is me, and I'm just, I'm just going to stay here and just complain about it. Mm -hmm. And we can all fall into that. I realize that. So there's all these different varying degrees. That's not been your, your story, though. And I'm sure you had to have had the moments where there have been discouragement and ups and downs and questions and so forth. Yes. But if I remember right, some of this began with dancing. Uh -huh. Tell us when you were a little girl, you didn't want to go out there and dance. Uh, tell us a little bit about that, because I saw some of the video on this. It, 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 it's really totally adorable, because you said you were only staring at your tap shoes the whole time. Uh -huh. so. Can we tell us a story about that? Because you never wanted to dance, and then you went on from there. I was six when my mom uh, enrolled me in tap dance lessons, and she didn't want to hide me away at all. And I went through all the dance classes, and at the very end of the year, the dance teacher announced we were going to have a performance in front of our family and friends. And I said, oh, I don't want to be a part of that. In fact, I told my mom to tell my dance teacher that I didn't want to be in the dance mm -hmm. recital. And so she went to the dance teacher the next day and told her that. And somehow they convinced me to buy my dance costume anyway. So I had a costume. And days later, I found myself out hiding behind the curtains, agreeing to go out on stage as long as I was put in the back row. Mm -hmm. And my dance teacher said, there's not going to be a back row for anyone. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be one row. And so I gathered up my courage, my mom prodded me, and, and I made it out to that front row mm -hmm. with all the other six-year-olds dancing, and I looked down at my tap shoes the first couple minutes. Then I heard the first round of applause, and my eyes started to lift. And with every new round of applause, my eyes lifted higher and mm -hmm. higher, and I started to get this confidence. 
And I went off the stage after that first recital, and I told my mom, I can't wait to get back on and perform. <laughs> <laughs> and I danced for about 14 years after 14 that. 14 years. Yes. Wow, that's incredible. Okay, so dancing. You got past that, yes. that, that challenge there. Mm -hmm. um, you've also uh, done a few other things, one of those being uh, Taekwondo. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your journey in the Taekwondo department of life. Mm -hmm. Well, Taekwondo was something for me, a way for me to vent out some anger and frustration. And my mom saw this as a good avenue, and she enrolled my brother and sister and I. And I was 10 at the time when I first started Taekwondo, and we were um, there practicing. The instructors modified the curriculum for me so that I could participate and, and move up the ranks from white belt to yellow belt to green belt, blue belt, all the way to black belt. And in four years, at the age of 14, I earned my first black belt. Wow. And it was incredible. It was truly empowering. And, and you're still involved in Taekwondo? I am. Right. Okay. I was there on Tuesday night. Yeah. In <laughs> fact, if we just fast forward to just not too uh, many moons back, uh -huh. um, many moons ago, you met someone through your Taekwondo class. Tell us about that. I met well, my future husband uh -huh. through Taekwondo. Yeah. He was an instructor, right? Yes, he yeah. was, at the time, he was an instructor, a fourth degree black belt in Taekwondo, and I was a first degree at the time, and went into a Taekwondo school to get some extra training for world championships. There he was, uh, instructing, and I'd never met him and didn't know anything about him, and found out that uh, he was a very nice guy. He saw me for me, and we started to get to know each other outside of the school, mm -hmm. and eventually, he asked me out on a date. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you were married three married years later. Now, yeah, married three years later, and yeah. now um, have been married for three and a half years. Wow, it's been awesome. Okay, so you're you're a you're a wife, and a black belt, and a, a dancing professional. Well, 14 years of dancing, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you have a Guinness World Record. Okay, tell us about the Guinness World Record. This is amazing. You, you have accomplished something that nobody, has anybody done it since you? No. Okay, so you're the only woman on the planet, okay, who has a Guinness World Record for this. What, tell us what that. I'm the first pilot to fly with just my feet on the controls mm -hmm. and certified to do so. Mm -hmm. And when I was 21, I decided to start flight lessons and to see how far mm -hmm. I could go. And, and I ended up pursuing it all the way to a sport pilot certificate and I'm able to fly solo up to 10,000 feet. I can take one passenger up, and I, as a result, earned the Guinness World Record Medal for that, yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Now, tell us about the struggles you would have had to learn to fly. I mean, for a lot of people, just learning to fly in and of itself has its struggles, but you had struggles even getting, getting the seatbelt on. I remember uh -huh. I, I saw in the video how you actually put the seatbelt together first, standing on the seat, and then you loosened it, you slipped down inside of it and then you tighten it around your waist. Uh -huh. All this with your feet. Yes. Okay, just to tell us a little bit about the difficulties or the struggles and obstacles you had learning how to fly. Well, the hardest thing, I mean, with arms or without arms, is landing the plane safely. Mm. And there's a lot involved when you're landing. It's just a very critical point. And for <laughs> me, it was it's just very difficult because I'm doing so many things at once. And also having to pull back on the yoke with my right foot, which I'm right foot dominant. And I pull back on the yoke and at the same time, I'm having to have access to the throttle. So my feet are both off the floor. And with that, I don't have much to ground me. So I'm using a lot of abs and core to pull back on the yoke and safely maneuver that airplane down, land it mm -hmm. safely. That was the dif most difficult thing for me, was safely learning how to land that airplane. Wow, wow. And the metal? The Guinness World Record. This, yeah. is, I think, is one of the coolest parts of your story, is that metal you don't even have anymore. You, you lost possession of it. Mm -hmm. Did someone steal it from you? Did somebody <laughs> no. break in and take it? No. What did you do with the medal? I gave the Guinness World Record medal to Pope Benedict when I met him for the first time at the Vatican. Wow, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the meeting with the Holy Father. It was incredible. Well, my sister, brother, and I, we were um, just tourists out in Rome, and we woke up one day. We decided to go to the Papal <coughs> Blessing in St. Peter's Square. And um, we were at the front row because my mom was in a wheelchair and we had to be at the handicap section. And my brother asked the security guard if I could give my medal to Pope Benedict. Mm. And we just didn't have any plans to be up there on stage. Within minutes, 
the security was ushering us to the stage. And we were sitting amongst all the people, um, the select few, on the other side of the barricades and being there for the papal blessing and afterwards meeting with the Pope one, uh, one at a time. Wow. We were, my sister and I were the very last of that group of people. Oh. And you could just hear cheering, chanting, crying, and everyone saying Viva el Papa and uh, just incredible experience uh, to be there and, and to feel that emotion and to be there and not even planning to be it there. Mm -hmm. And then walking up at the very end and um, saying, you know, I'd like you to have my, my, my Guinness World Record medal. And I asked the Pope if he could pray for my mom, who at the time had a lot of health struggles. Mm. And he said, I will, I will, in very clear English. <laughs> <laughs> now, <clears throat> have you ever regretted giving it to him? Do you wish he'd give it back? Or? No, no <laughs> regrets there. <laughs> that was an incredible moment. <laughs> so it's okay that he Worth keeps it. it. All right. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, I mean, that's an amazing story. Um, okay. Did you meet him more than once, though? He said the first time? No, that oh. was the only, the okay. first and only okay. time, yes. Okay. It was, it was okay. pretty incredible. So what are their list of achievements then? I mean, uh, Guinness World Record, flying an airplane, black belt in Taekwondo, you know, tap dancing. I mean, these, this is incredible. For, for the average person, that's incredible. You have, obviously, a different situation. And I like how it, it, your website actually states it as you don't have a disability, you have a different ability. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I mean, that, that's, that's a great way of, of seeing this. Um, any other accomplishments that you'd like to speak of uh, to the world? Uh, all, the fact that the ATA, the American Taekwondo Association, actually altered the curriculum for Taekwondo training for people who might have similar situations, right? Yes. Yeah. So for here and out, for whoever wants to train who may not have use of their arms or were born without arms, there's something there for them. Okay. It's incredible. You have a driver's license, you can drive. Driver's license. I actually mm -hmm. um, picked up a rental car uh, in order to be at the show today oh. and got quite a few reactions at the rental car office, but uh, it I'm was sure. entertaining. <laughs> 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 well, just so, to get through uh, all the luggage and, uh, you know, without arms, that must be... I have a pretty good system because yeah. I've traveled to 20 countries as a motivational speaker and mm -hmm. I carry everything on my back in a backpack uh -huh. so I don't have to lug a luggage. Well, oh, for okay. one, the, the wheeled luggages don't work for me. So right. I, I carry it all on my back and I, I, I mean, I pack very lightly and I carry that on my back and I hop, um, go from the airport to the rental car counter uh -huh. and I show them my driver's license and they give me the keys and I, that's how I ended up here. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. And now, um, so any other any other accomplishments you want to speak of that uh, uh, we don't know about that, that would be important to know here? Well, definitely my journey in faith. Right. And that's a huge part of many people may not be aware of because a lot of these other achievements kind of outshine the, right. the, the most important part. And that's definitely where I draw my strength and where I go when it's most difficult because not every day for me is positive. <laughs> I'm human mm -hmm. and naturally mm -hmm. I have a struggling day or so or have an issue with something and, and, and I turn to my faith to pull me out of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, and your, your website is, is um, you, you just, your website is great because it has a lot of little puns on, on feet and arms yeah. and such. So um, uh, the name of the book is disarm your limits disarm your limits <laughs> which which so you really don't have a, a, a problem or an issue with just kind of laying it out there and saying look this is what it is let's let's get to the root of it all here yeah just be okay. direct all right have you always had that have you always had that within you no. or yeah tell us a little bit about that part of the journey of just getting getting to the point of where you can speak so powerfully about it now and we'll talk after that. We'll go to break here in a bit and come back mm -hmm. and talk more about the motivational speaking aspect uh -huh. of what you do with your life. But, but have you always had that? Uh, or or what, what the, what's that journey to get to the point of being able to be so, so open and clear about, about talking? Well, about it was definitely a number of years and um, a lot of, uh, I guess, a, a journey to figure out that this is who I am. And there were times in elementary school mm -hmm. and in high school where I wanted to wear long sleeve sweaters to cover up my armlessness or to wear prosthetics. And I felt that that was not necessarily out of choice, but that was something that um, it was suggested that I wear prosthetics. Mm -hmm. But in my own experience, I could do things better with my feet. So it was mm -hmm. actually more of a, a struggle having to wear those every day. Right. And it was more out of this, you know, 
pressure to conform. Mm -hmm. And that whole struggle was um, difficult. I mean, I wanted to be just like everyone else. I had an older brother, Jason, and a younger sister, Jackie, and they had their arms. They weren't different in any way. And for me to stand out, I would do things to avoid that. I would do things like sit in the back of the classroom or um, try to sneak in the cafeteria and eat with my feet in the back corner so no one would see mm. me. And just to hide my difference in every way so that I could avoid the extra attention that came right. with my um, being different. Right. How did your parents respond to that when, when you were doing those things, kind of trying to stay out of the way, kind of hide uh -huh. your back? What, what did you hear from your mom and your dad? Well. You know, my mom would always say that, you know, God has a plan for you, and they encouraged me to not hide. Mm -hmm. That's why my mom had me in dance lessons mm -hmm. on stage every summer, and, and my dad was very confident when we walked around. Um, and it was n to not hide my difference. Mm -hmm. Finally, after 11 years of wearing fake arms, I decided to give them up. Mm -hmm. And I was 14 at the time, and I walked to the bus stop. I went to a regular public school, went on a regular bus, and I was, it was the beginning of eighth grade, I walked to the bus stop without them. Hmm. And I felt so much lighter, freer, mm. and finally the person God created me to be. And when I walked on the bus, I promised myself I would never again wear them. Really? To this day, they remain in the closet. Huh. It was a huge step for me. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. And you say that you, uh, you, you, you suffered some, you know, the looks, the comments, the stares, and so forth. What was that like as a child, especially? It was, it was hard because, um, as a kid, sometimes on the playground, because of my, my um, fake arms, I was known as Captain Hook or Robot Girl. Mm -hmm. And those things, they, they hurt. You know, they, they sound silly and not so harmful. Maybe that's just a childish thing. But for me, it was kind of a dehumanizing experience. Sure. Because it wasn't like they, you know, they saw me as something less than human. <laughs> and it was, it was hard. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure you could sense the... the um the intention behind it was not just all in fun spiritedness. It was, no. uh, you know, there was some serious, uh, you know, effort to try to tear you down and hurt you a little bit there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, how did you deal with that? I mean, internally. Um, internally, I kept a lot of it in, and I mean, my mom always told me, "Oh, just ignore them, just ignore them." But mm -hmm. you know, it still hurts. Mm -hmm. It's I have to be honest. You know, you can't ignore them to a certain extent, but it still hurts inside. And a lot of times I just felt really, I felt bad about it. And I, you know, I'd want to just go out there. And at times it helped propel me to do the things I did. Sure. Because it helped me deal with a lot of that to go out and have ways to vent it through yeah. Taekwondo or through cool. different activities yeah. and um, get through that. A little fire yeah. in the belly, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. We're going to run to a break right now. When we come back, let's get into a little bit more about what it is that really sustains you okay. more deeply. And, and also, you know, the fact that you're a motivational speaker and you've been to 20 countries, you say. That's incredible. And you've got a very powerful message for a lot of people. And also, uh, she has met, Jessica, you've met with some other people who are also struggling in different ways and may not have the same list of accomplishments as you, mm -hmm. but there's something much deeper we need to get at here by the end of the show as to what is really the most important part of this whole, this whole story and this whole journey. Don't go away, we'll be back after this. Welcome back to Life on the Rock. I'm Doug Berry along with Father Mark. The Rock House compadres are here in your living room or speaking through your radio at this very moment or possibly online if you're streaming us online. Mm -hmm. And we have with us Jessica Cox. Jessica, <laughs> you are an amazing young lady, but not just because you have amazing achievements in light of the fact that you were born with no arms, but for even more profound, sublime, and mysterious reasons. Do you like those words? Profound, sublime, and mysterious? Okay. All in the same sentence. <laughs> yeah, it worked out really well. All right, you're a married woman. You have, you have a vocation, a wife. You are uh, blessed to have good parents. 
Uh, you are a motivational speaker. Before we get into more about your personal life, uh, let's talk about what you say as a motivational speaker. Particular crowd or audience or age group that you speak to, or just speak anybody? Speak to every, every and all groups, and I uh, have a message that resonates with everyone. And when I'm up there on stage saying it's okay to be different, everyone resonates with their, uh, with me, and in, in their own challenges, mm -hmm. and they see the struggles in their own life and how they can break through them. A lot of times that we're held back because of fear, and I talk a lot about that and how fear limits us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think that when you're speaking, like for example, let, let's, let's paint the picture. You walk on stage, people may hear that this woman is gonna speak to us and this is a woman, she's born with no arms and that's gotta get a lot of people kind of thinking right off the bat. Mm -hmm. So what is the reaction people normally have when they see you for the first time on stage? You're in front of a, in front of a group? Uh, I just spoke uh, last night before flying in this morning and it was interesting because this was a group of youth and I came out, it was as a surprise, and you could see this kind of shock on their face, like she's really here, <laughs> and it's really true, mm -hmm. because I think some people have never met anyone who doesn't have arms. Mm -hmm. It is a rare condition, and mm -hmm. to see that in front of them, and most importantly, I think, when they hear that I'm a pilot, it, they're trying to make sense of it all there sure. when I show up, and, and it really breaks down walls in their life, and it's a blessing. So a lot of, sh kind of a, a, lot of, a little bit of shock and awe <laughs> yes, look on their faces. Yeah. yeah, I you know, in the video that I saw of you speaking before a group of, of teenagers, you you speak about the words I can't. Tell yes. us a little bit about how you feel about those two words put in that order, I can't. I don't like those words. I say <laughs> I, I first of all ask the audience, when was the last time you said I can't? And most oftentimes they've said it that day. Mm. And it's un unfortunate because I say that when we say those words, we limit what we can do, and it sets us up for failure. We're limiting what we can do just by what comes out of our mouth, mm -hmm. and we start to believe it. And one of those things is that whenever someone says that I can't do something, it fuels me to do it, and I have, I choose not to wear it, use those words. Now, St. John Paul II used, used the, um, the term, the indomitable human spirit, you know, different times that he would speak about. God created us really with a spirit that does not want to be dominated, mm -hmm. that, you know, wants to be, you know, surrendered to God, of course, but not dominated by the things of this world, and especially by things such as fear. And St. John Paul II would use the, the words a lot, you know, be not afraid. But this is something you, you have kind of made a, a mantra of your own is just to be not afraid and to get mm -hmm. out there and just, just go forth and do these things. Um, did, you ever, did you ever feel though, as you were going through the journey uh, and are still going through the journey, that you were never enough? Yes, I did. Yeah, tell us about that because I think that that is something that so many of us can relate to in one way or another. Mm -hmm. and, and oftentimes it's that we don't think we're enough in God's eyes if we're not raised with any kind of faith to appreciate you know, God's profound love for us. But really, there are people who live their day struggling with feeling as though they have to prove themselves to people all around them, even those that are closest to them. Mm -hmm. So give some motivational speaking words okay. to all of us about what that's like for you and what you would say to help people rise above that. Well, I think that the moment I was born, I, I somewhat had that feeling of not being enough because of the devastation and shock. And though I was a, a day old, it still, I think it still rocked my world in a way that affected me. And of course, in my family, I was accepted and loved with un unconditional love. But the moment I got out in public, my mom would even tell the story of um, putting me in a shopping cart and pushing me around the grocery store just to pick up a couple items. And she'd be inundated with things like, oh, poor little girl, what happened to her? And my mom would say, oh, she don't feel sorry for her. She's gonna be just fine. But naturally, that influenced me and the society's perspective of me not being enough had a profound effect. And it's something that I think even when you see the me in the media, models who are digitized to look mm -hmm. even better, or uh, you know, you hear the phrase, you counting the 10 fingers and 10 toes mm -hmm. when a baby's born. And all of these type of things, it makes it feel as though if you're not within those parameters, you are less than. And it's something that I struggled with and realized that though society may not see me as being enough, 
there is someone who does. Hmm. And that's more powerful than anything else. Right. So for those people who don't have that part of the equation of knowing that there's someone who does see you, mm -hmm. speaking, of course, of God, what do you say to them? What do you say to those out there who don't have that relationship with God and are struggling with that, feeling as though they're not enough to anybody, especially maybe even to God? Mm -hmm. What would you say to them? You're enough. And I love it. Um, my favorite part of the Bible, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Mm. You knew me mm. before I was even formed. Yeah. So when you meet people, Jessica, when you're traveling and, and people come up to you who are struggling with some sort of different ability, whether they're you know, struggling with hearing or maybe no arms or some other physical ability, what do you say to them? Well, I want to tell them that they are enough. <laughs> and no matter what, whatever it is that anyone says to them that they are. What do they say back to you? I mean, how many people, you, you've got to have affected so many people's lives, given so many people so much hope. What do they say back to you at times like that? I mean, the video that I saw of you meeting a young girl who, who couldn't hear very well, and your smile, you have a very contagious smile, mm -hmm. you know, what, what, is that, what, is that, what is that moment like when you're looking at someone who for the first time maybe they're feeling as though, yes, I am, I am important. There's something critically precious or, or valuable about me. What, what is that like to be part of that moment and that encounter? It's, it's a, a true gift to be able to do that. It's, it's something that if I had arms and hands, I, I wouldn't be able to do. Mm. And uh, the arms and hands that God has given me are more powerful than any arms could, or hands could reach. Yeah. I noticed that in one of your videos, you did say that, mm -hmm. that if you could ask for arms and hands back, you wouldn't. Why is that? Because I have them in, in, I have God's hands and mm. arms in a different form. Yeah. See, and that's the part I think that's so important that we need to get at here is that there's so many people in the world right now, Jessica, that are, that are, that are defining themselves by, by things that are, that are not at the root and the depth of what is accurate. What I mean by that is sexual orientation or define themselves by their looks, define themselves by their athletic ability, define themselves by their money and their bank, by their talents, their skills, and so forth. And your message really overall is something much deeper, is that to define themselves, define all of ourselves, by, by what above everything else? That we're a child of God. Yeah. And there's nothing greater than that. You said before the show, what it is that sustains you, that really keeps you going. Because awards and, and black belts and flying planes, I mean, incredible as they may be, mm -hmm. all that will also all fade away. What is it that really then sustains you and keeps you going above everything else? It's that, that faith and that strength that comes mm -hmm. from God and, and He's there every day and He's showing me the way through all the challenges and he's showing ways that I can bring greater glory to him. That's, it's really powerful. It's wonderful to be a part of it. Sometimes I'd even, I don't even know the plans he has, but he's showing them to me and it's, it's, a, it's precious, yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it is. We're gonna go to break now. When we come back from the break, last segment, um, we'll talk a little bit about, uh, again, more about the message that you give to people as you yes. travel. And the fact that there are, there, are, there are millions probably listening and watching right now that are hurting in some way, shape, or form. Maybe you have their arms and legs. Maybe you got the best looks in the world and everybody in the world seems to love you, but there's something inside you that feels, feels broken, lost, empty, misplaced, and yet the joy that you're talking about is something everybody can have. So we're going to come back and talk to Jessica more about that. So don't go away. We're back after this break.
Welcome back to Life on the Rock. Doug Berry here along with Father Mark. We have with us Jessica Cox. She is uh, an amazing individual in many, many ways. Uh, she's an amazing individual because of her, her dedication and devotion to just not giving up the indomitable human spirit. Uh, great list of accomplishments, uh, tremendous um, abilities showing forth in, in, in some of the greatest trials and struggles, being born with no arms and yet not, not giving up, being very determined. And I know that you had said before, Jessica, that it's because of your relationship with Christ and, and that dedication. And we're going to get into more of, of your, your regimen to have that relationship, that encounter with Christ. We have a video we're going to go to, though, here um, on Christ the King. Now, feast day uh, for Christ the King is coming very soon here. And it's important that we all understand that he is the king of the universe, the king of the world, the king of all of us, king of our hearts and souls. And without a relationship with our king, our heavenly king, we all are missing something so important and so critical. So let's check out this video. You're going to like this from a real life Catholic on Christ. The Jesus Christ is a king. The Jews weren't waiting for some hippie to come along or somebody who would be their buddy or homeboy. They were waiting for a king to come and rule the nations and establish peace and justice on the earth. When he was born, the three magi, the wise men, came looking for him. They were looking for the king of the Jews. When he stood before Pontius Pilate, he said, you're right in saying I'm a king. When he started his ministry, he announced the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He talked about the final judgment where he would sit over the world, over all the nations, and judge them as king. When he hung on the cross, king of the Jews hung over his head. And the good thief next to him said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said, I promise you today, you'll be with me in paradise. But this wasn't like any other king. He wasn't born in a palace. He was born in a manger. He lived his whole life in poverty. Instead of trying to acquire more and more wealth and power, he renounced it every chance that he got. He didn't wear a crown of gold. He wore a crown made of thorns. He was lifted high above the world, but it was on a cross, blessing and forgiving those who killed him. But make no mistake about it, he is a king. And a king has a kingdom, and a kingdom has boundaries. He invites us to accept his reign over our minds and hearts and wills and lives. See, having a king means you're not the king, I'm not the king. It means we don't do religion on our terms, but on his. We can't be cafeteria Catholics picking and choosing the doctrines that we follow, picking and choosing our commandments that we want, chucking out the rest. We don't set the terms of our faith, we receive it. Jesus Christ is the king. The fact that he's a king means he reigns over our hearts and minds, which means that our faith has implications on our lives that stretch way beyond what happens in church on the pew every Sunday. The fact that he's my king means I'm called to serve. He washed his apostles' feet, and he told them, you call me Lord and Master, look what I'm doing. If you call me Lord and Master, this is how you're supposed to serve other people. Look, I know it might be scary, this whole idea of having a king. In fact, kingdoms of this world have gone out of style because a lot of kings have violated people's freedom in establishing their kingdoms and their power. But Jesus is unlike any other king. He's a king who guarantees our freedom. Here's a king who makes us free from sin, free from self-centeredness, free even from death, free from the reign of this world. This is a king who invites us not just to be subjects, but who raises us up and makes us heirs, heirs of far more than kingdoms of brick and mortar. Jesus Christ is a king. Is he your king? So there he is, there he is, the king. King of Kings. And I know before the show, I had asked you, what is it that really sustains you and keeps you going? And you mentioned, you know, this relationship with, with Christ, with Christ our King. What is your daily life like? What, I mean, your, your, your regimen to have that relationship, you know, daily, weekly, monthly, what, what do you go through? Where do you, 
Where do you put your time, your energy into in order to have that, that friendship with the king? Uh, well, I go to church every Sunday and I pray the rosary. It's very powerful. Um, and it's incredible hearing the gospel and through the Bible and, and being able to just have it part of everyday life. And however small it may be, whether it's a small prayer or a full rosary, mm -hmm. it's just, or even just through grace at, at mm -hmm. our meals. It's, mm -hmm. it's just having that every day having something. So the consistent prayer life, sacramental yes. life, of yes. course. Um, and, and what is it when you, when someone comes up to you, you're, you're speaking publicly somewhere in the world and someone comes up to you and, and they're sharing with you. And I'm only imagining, I can only imagine how after you present your story to them and they, they meet you and they see you and they know what you've done and who you are and they get to know you personally. Um, I can only imagine walls are knocked down and doors have got to be open. What sorts of things do you hear from people when they come forward after they hear you speak? A lot of them come and share their own personal story of how they've dealt with a certain challenge. And just to hear my story eliminates some of their excuses. Mm -hmm. And they see that they could do so much more. And they ask me, you know, what is your strength? And I tell them, you know, it's, this, it's the strength from my faith. And there's those moments when I'm only human and have a difficult day mm -hmm. or when I'm too scared to go up and fly the airplane because it was my greatest fear of flying. And I prayed so much before I became a pilot and what, mm -hmm. well, throughout my training, I prayed rosaries. I prayed every time I took off. It was, mm -hmm. I had, I had to have that communication mm -hmm. and knowing that there's someone here who's always with me. And you, you mentioned trying to go to daily mass too. Talk about yes. that devotion of the Eucharist and mass. And daily mass, oh, the, the Eucharist is mm -hmm. so incredible. And when I was living very <coughs> close to the vicinity of a church and I was able to go every day, mm. it, it, um, it's a little further away than before, but um, that was a gift every day mm. to start off the day right. with the yeah. Eucharist. Yeah. Yeah. And, and your, your, your parents taught you that or was that kind of a conversion experience for you? Or? I think my parents, they made sure I had the upbringing and we went to church every Sunday, but mm -hmm. it has to be a personal relationship right. and it has to be a personal choice mm -hmm. because, you know, you grow up and you have to make your own choices. And, and I think it's so important too, you, you s talked about fear and now everybody in life has some fears, but that link between overcoming fear and prayer, I think a lot of us, Skip that, you know, we can wring our hands and stay in the worries and never utter a prayer about the fear, you know, take it to God and ask for help. But is that generally your advice to people about overcoming it's, fear? It's yeah. what helped me get over yeah. my fear flight. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, you also, um, uh, you also seem to have the ability to, to touch people, you know, on a deeper level. And again, not just because of the disabilities or the struggles with, with um, things like this. Have you found in the people that you've met that some of the more wounded people are people who seem to have everything than the people who might be missing arms, hearing, something of that effect? I mean, there's a lot of people that go through life that seem to have everything, and the mm -hmm. world might think they're the happiest people in the world because they've got the riches, they've got the popularity, yeah. they've got the, the, what the world says is the best looks and the best talents and skills and such. Do they seem to be sometimes more disabled than, than people who might be missing hearing or, or eyesight or arms or legs? It's, it's an interesting thing that you bring that up because I think if it wasn't for the struggle, I definitely wouldn't have as strong of a faith that I have. Mm -hmm. And sometimes struggle and, and that kind of um, difficulty brings that out mm -hmm. in a way and it helped me be, become more resilient mm -hmm. um, because I went through that childhood struggle of learning how to get dressed on my own. I was able to address my flight training challenges in a different way. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't have the previous struggle, then I wouldn't have what it takes, the tools that I needed to move forward with other challenges. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, the faith, the faith that I needed mm -hmm. to get through my greatest fears, to get through the greatest struggles. All right. Do you think that people respond well to your message overall? 
I think so. Yeah. Do you think yeah. that they? Did, do you think that they look deeper at themselves, though? I mean, because it's easy, I think, for someone to see somebody with, with uh, you know, missing her arms and think, um, oh yeah, boy, poor her, you know. Yeah. Yeah. For some people, that's an important message. But do you think that everybody? Because everybody can understand if they try. I think we could all really grasp something from this. You know, again, the, the, it's, it's the St. Augustine quote, my heart is restless till it rests in you. He seemed to have had everything, you know, and yet there was still something really missing inside of his heart. So I'm just, I'm just really wondering if there are people out there who would look at your situation and think, yeah, fortunately, I don't have any struggles. You know, yeah. I don't have any, any d disabilities or, or, or challenges like she must have. But do you think most people can get this? Do you think, do you think people realize that we all have something that we're, where, that God allows us to have to carry in order to try to draw this out of us that you're talking about. Yes. Yeah. It's, I feel like it's for all those years as a kid wondering, you know, why did God make me this way? It took a couple years mm. to realize that this is why. Mm. And it's the truth with all our struggle because everyone has something, mm -hmm. no matter whether it's emotional, it's like you said, psychological. Sometimes it comes in physical form. Mm -hmm. But everyone has something that they have to carry. Yeah. What about, uh, you know, I know in the catechism in its section on virtue, it, it talks about, uh, I was surprised how much it, it talks about the natural aspect of, you know, practicing and repeated efforts to grow in a virtue. In some of your talks, do you talk about goals mm -hmm. and efforts and not, you know, motivation and not give up? What are the things you say about that? It's so easy to give up, and mm -hmm. that's why I've eliminated I can't from my vocabulary, mm -hmm. and I challenge others when they hear me speak to do so, because it's a lot easier to give up mm -hmm. than to get past that wall. Mm -hmm. But um, one of the things that I love, a quote about desire, walls are only there to stop the people who don't want it badly enough. Mm -hmm. And we really just have to get through it. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's just that extra amount of persistence yeah, yeah. and perseverance. And that's always something you've had. You've, you've, you've just had the strong desires and wants and you just went after it. Huh? Well, I've had it eventually. You never watched <laughs> Gilligan's Island or Brady Bunch or wasted your time there? <laughs> no, I mean, I still, I mean, I have my moments and I'm <laughs> very human in that sense. And I mean, I mean, there I'm, but I think that because I had to learn early on, uh -huh. um, even when it came to just learning how to walk as right. toddlers, right. you know, hold on to furniture to pull themselves up. Yeah. I, yeah had to develop the muscles in my legs right, to right. stand up right yeah. away and just early on just had to be part of my who I am mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and that's something I, I'm able to tap into but that's great. I think that that's something and that's why we need our challenges and our struggles yeah. to be able to bring that out because yeah. that strength is within it's just a matter of tapping into it and it's critical in your story I know you mentioned how much your family supported you and helped you and, and gave you so much it seemed like Mm -hmm. in that way so they yeah. did I feel very blessed in that yeah. yes yeah. and so people can contact you for for speaking engagements and such mm -hmm. through is it rightfooted.com correct rightfooted.com rightfooted.com and the name of the book again is disarm your limits disarm your limits yeah. you can pick that up at rightfooted.com it's just <laughs> it's great and the fact that you're very open about the struggles that we all have in one way shape or form is 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 simply heroic and so necessary because it is easy, folks, you know this, for all of us to just kind of bury ourselves in the things of the world and just think that we don't have certain difficulties and struggles. Or we can claim the victim status and think, you know what, I can't get through this because it's just too hard for me. And, you know, Jessica, you're a tremendous example of what God's grace can do no matter what our situation is. So just thanks for being on the show. You just did a great job. I appreciate it so much. Rightfooted.com is the website. I want to encourage you all to go check it out. And uh, remember... You know, the motivation and strength that we all need comes first and foremost from our relationship with Christ. So God bless you. Thank you for Thank being you, here. Thank you. Father, as only you, as I always say, can take us out. <laughs> well, may our Heavenly Father shine his face upon you. May he give you his peace and may he pour his Holy Spirit into your hearts with every good gift and grace. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We'll see you next week on Life on the Rock. Awesome. Thank you.